Hello, I'm Leslie Ewing, and I'd like to congratulate the organizers of this event for having the forethought to or foresight to have moved this to a virtual conference and also thank them for allowing us to schedule these and make our recordings at a time that's convenient for us. Now, I believe many of the people who are at this event have heard about climate change and sea level rise, and most are aware that rising sea level will bring with it changes to the coast. Increased inundation and flooding, wave impacts, changing erosion patterns, and in many locations with fixed development inland of the coast, a shrinking beach, and concerns about what's called coastal squeeze. Therein lies a major dilemma for coastal planners and engineers. We've long addressed sea level rise when it was following the small changes that have been observed historically, but many communities are unprepared to really address a future, a future coastline with dramatically different sea levels than we've observed in our recent past. In my remaining time, I'm going to cover some efforts by federal, state, and local agencies to provide communities in California with some science that explains the key concerns about sea level rise, some policy guidance so that each community does not have to start from nothing, and some financial incentives and planning tools to identify local vulnerabilities, and finally, a recent effort to help with infrastructure adaptation. So this quick tour starts in 2008. But if I were to give you just a full history of all the efforts that have been going on in California dealing with sea level rise, this would be going back to the 1980s. These reports have provided the broad statewide context for sea level rise planning, providing principles to incorporate measures that protect California's most vulnerable populations, achieve multiple benefits from efforts to reduce climate risk and prioritize green infrastructure solutions, and to integrate climate risk reduction with emissions reductions where possible. Climate assessments at both the federal and state level have noted the urgency of dealing with climate change, both at the mitigation or emission reduction side and at the adaptation side. And since most studies agree that emission reductions are not gonna come fast enough or be large enough to reverse some of the sea level rise effects that we'll observe over the coming decades, we need to be doing both. And in California, we've also realized that many areas along the coast are already at risk, even without the worsening effects of sea level rise. One of the major efforts to provide communities with best available science was this three-state study for California, Oregon, and Washington that identified ranges of sea level rise and sea level change and provided some general time periods over which these might occur. And while California had long been recommending a scenario-based approach to most planning efforts, and especially with sea level concerns. This report really highlighted the importance of scenario-based planning for overall land use efforts and initial project planning as well. The initial three state reports looked at two geographic areas, those north of Cape Mendocino and those south of Cape Mendocino. But the bulk of the California coastal population lives in the large area south of Cape Mendocino. And from experience with those areas, we realized that there already is a difference in response to the more large scale global sea level changes. Therefore, California undertook studies to refine the sea level projections for the main tide stations along the California coast and to provide different probabilities of sea level exceedance for these areas. This is an example for San Francisco of the updated sea level rise projections using the RCP 8.5 emission scenario. As you can see, the projections are by decade with different risk aversion projections. The report also provided the median projection, a likely range from which the low aversion projections were developed and a 5% probability of exceedance. For land use planning purposes, the California Coastal Commission uses these three projected ranges, the low risk aversion, medium high risk aversion, and extreme high risk aversion. The Coastal Commission augmented these projections with a more focused report and guidance on how these reports can assist with both community level planning for coastal areas through what we call local coastal programs and how these reports can be used for the review of applications for individual permits. For both efforts, the Commission advocates several guiding principles. 
using best available science and decision making, using precautionary principle, prioritizing natural adaptation, and considering phased adaptation when possible. Also, making sure that the issues of climate and environmental justice are considered. The California guidance recognizes that we should not hold all types of development to the same risk aversion levels. Coastal access is a very important part of the California Coastal Act, and its loss would have high consequences. However, access can often adapt to changing water levels, assuming that vertical or inland relocation is possible. And so often in looking at access area, access issues, the low risk aversion scenario is an acceptable way to proceed with their planning and design. However, most development is less adaptable than docks and access paths. Most homes, hotels, and other buildings are difficult to move once they're built, providing very little adaptive capacity. And we usually have these types of projects consider the medium high risk aversion sea level rise projections, at least in the planning stage. While it might not always be possible to design for this scenario, it's important to understand that future conditions might affect these projects significantly and identify at the beginning stages for their planning and design what adaptation might be possible if future conditions are worse than those conditions used at the design level. Finally, there is some development that is so important to the community or that has such limited adaptive capacity that the extreme aversion scenario should be used. Things like new highways, power plants, wastewater treatment plants, and such critical infrastructure. This photograph is of an existing water treatment plant where the commission denied an application to undertake major upgrades to the facility since those upgrades would soon be at risk from rising sea level, wave impacts, and flooding. As part of the phased adaptation, the commission approved maintenance of the existing protection for this facility for the time that would allow them to provide for a new location that would ensure safety and stability over the long term. And in California, most of the coastal planning that goes on, at least for the open coast, is a joint effort between the California Coastal Commission and local governments through documents called local coastal programs. So in addition to the guidance documents that have been prepared by the commission, the state has been providing grants to local governments to undertake sea level rise vulnerabilities assessments and developing adaptation options. And this map shows where some of those grants have been given to date. But one of the recurring themes that we've gotten from the assessments that have been developed is to identify, it's important to identify where coastal hazards will be and what the risks will be. And we've seen that infrastructure, a lot of the infrastructure along the coast is going to be at risk. It's at risk now or it will be at risk in the future. This includes outfalls, power plants, railroad corridors, local highways, and major highway routes along the whole coast. It's fine to say in principle that new infrastructure should use the extreme risk aversion for design, but what do we do with infrastructure that's at risk right now. And we understand that infrastructure is at risk throughout most of the coast. Every California coastal county has some infrastructure that is at risk or will be at risk. And planning for infrastructure is complicated and complex, even without including the issues of current and future sea level rise. Not only are the systems often part of a network, they're interconnected, and there are many more stakeholders than are usual for part of a single family home or even a hotel or commercial development. Understanding this complexity and the need to perhaps treat infrastructure slightly different than other types of development, the commission received funding from NOAA to develop planning guidance for critical infrastructure and help introduce opportunities to rely upon natural infrastructure where appropriate. In doing this, we had a lot of stakeholder engagement and since this project has been a fairly short term and small project, we narrowed down the focus of infrastructure to transportation, which includes roads, highways, and railroads, and to water systems, both water supply and wastewater treatment systems. Some of the other feedback we got from the stakeholders was that big changes, especially for infrastructure, big changes could not happen all at once, that phased approaches would be needed. Also, that 
no one option would work for every situation. And finally, that while utilities and transportation planners were interested in natural infrastructure, they needed some more information and help with how best to include this into adaptation options. And while the infrastructure goes into detail, the infrastructure guidance goes into detail about these issues, the Coastal Commission already has experience with phased adaptation. One example is from Pedras Blanca shown here, where several emergency permits have been issued to address flooding and erosion concerns. Almost three miles of Coastal Highway 1 had been threatened for decades by erosion and wave action. The fronting beach had disappeared in some sections and the roadway was continually damaged as waves would break over some sections of the highway during periods of high swell. Through a series of permits in the 1990s, the Coastal Commission authorized construction and repair of a rock revetment to protect the highway, but with permit conditions which required Caltrans our local transportation agency to study the feasibility of relocating the roadway inland. By authorizing a permit for armoring, but conditioning that permit to require Caltrans to complete long-term planning process, the commission and Caltrans are set up for a phased adaptation approach that ensures protection of this important transportation corridor while a long-term resilience strategy is both identified and implemented. And for this area, what we've identified now is that we have moved the road inland. Land has been added to the Hearst San Simeon State Park. An additional three and a half miles of coastal trail has been established. Ag land and scenic views have been protected through scenic conservation easements. And some of the coastal wetland and coastal prairie areas throughout this area have been mitigated as part of the new project. We also have experience with natural infrastructure for shore protection. This is a section of Pacific Coast Highway in Northern San Diego County. Like the area at Pedras Blancas, the roadway had been threatened by flooding and erosion. A revetment had been installed, but it needed regular maintenance, and it was not conducive to coastal access either along the area or to the ocean. The bottom photograph shows the coastal dune system that's been built with a rock core for extreme storm protection. The dunes are expected to provide protection from about a 50 year storm event and remain effective for protection of the highway for about 30 or 40 years. This would be with regular sand infusions that could come from lagoon immediately up coast from where this picture was taken. It's not protection for the long term or for the extreme case, but it provides for a phased response to a current problem. Now these examples are included in the infrastructure guidance report that we're preparing. We're in the final stages of this report and hope to have a copy for review in the next months. And I'd like to thank you for letting me take you on this rapid tour of what's going on in California to address sea level rise and to help communities adapt to rising seas. If you wanna follow our guidance on critical infrastructure, I provided a link for that program in the bottom left-hand corner. If you have other questions, feel free to ask me during the question and answer period or ask me and can't contact me at the address provided below.